At the close of the case for the prosecution, Mr. Fonsell for the accused brought an application for the accused's discharge in terms of section 174 of the Criminal Procedure Act number 51 of 1977. The accused was charged with the following offences. A. Conspiracy to commit the offences of kidnapping, robbery with aggravating circumstances, and murder. Brackets. Count one. B. Kidnapping. Count two. C. Robbery with aggravating circumstances. Count three. D. Murder. Count four. And E. Obstructing the administration of justice. Count five. In count one, it was specifically alleged that the accused conspired with Zola Tongo, Mzwe Madoda Kwabe, and Zolelia Mgeni to commit the alleged offenses, quote, by entering into an agreement with Tongo in terms of which Tongo would procure the services of a person or persons to do one or more or all of the following. First subparagraph simulate a hijacking of Tongo's motor vehicle. Next sub paragraph, simulating a kidnapping and robbery of Tongo and the accused, and or, next sub paragraph, effect the kidnapping, robbery and murder of the deceased Annie Dewani. And in that, according to the conspiracy agreement, the accused would provide payment to the perpetrators as well as to Tongo for the kidnapping, robbery, and murder of the deceased, Annie Dewani, end quote. Counts two to four contain the allegation that Tongo, Kwabe, and Mgeni acted in furtherance of a common purpose to kidnap the deceased, rob the deceased, and kill the deceased. The other accomplice, Monde Mulombo, was not charged as a co-conspirator. It follows that is it therefore crucial for the state case to prove that the accused entered into an alleged conspiracy agreement with Tongo. Failing such proof, the accused cannot be convicted of any of the first four counts and accordingly also not on the fifth. The legal position. Section 174 of the Criminal Procedure Act provides, quote, if at the close of the case for the prosecution at any trial, the court is of the opinion that there is no evidence that the accused committed the offence referred to in the charge or any offence of which he may be convicted on the charge, it may return a verdict of not guilty. It is well established that no evidence, put that in quotes, does not mean no evidence at all but rather no evidence on which a reasonable court, acting carefully, might convict. The question whether a court should grant a discharge at this stage is one which entails a discretion by the trial court. It is a discretion which must, self-evidently, be exercised judicially. The judicial pronouncements on the manner in which the trial court must exercise its discretion have over the years been contentious. I do not intend to give a full historical overview and will confine myself to a brief reference to those cases that help define the scope of this court's discretion in terms of section 174. In State versus Shuping, S-H-U-P-I-N-G and others, Supra, Himstra CJ reviewed the case law history of discharge applications and formulated the test as follows at 120 in fine to 121. Quote, at the close of the state case, when discharge is considered, the first question is, first subparagraph, is there evidence on which a reasonable man might convict? If not, Next subparagraph, is there a reasonable possibility that the defense evidence might supplement the state case? If the answer to either question is yes, there should be no discharge and the accused should be placed on his defense. The second part of the latter test did not always find favor. 
in State versus Puravata and others, 1992-2, South African Criminal Law Reports, 544. V. de Toy AJ stated the following, quote, the presumption in favor of innocence, the fact that the onus rests on the state as well as the dictates of justice, in my view, will normally require an exercise of the discretion under Section 174 in favour of an accused person where the state case is virtually and basically non-existent. Strengthening or supplementation of a non-existent state case is a physical impossibility." End quote. Since the inception of our constitutional order, Conflicting views arose as to whether or not the Constitution has impacted on the test to be applied by a court in an application in terms of Section 174. These decisions culminated in the Supreme Court of Appeal finally deciding the issue in State v. Leboxa, 2001, brackets 2, South African Criminal Law Reports, 703 SCA, inter alia as follows. Quote, paragraph 18, I have no doubt that an accused person, brackets, whether or not he is represented, close brackets, is entitled to be discharged at the close of the case for the prosecution if there is no possibility of a conviction other than if he enters the witness box and incriminates himself. The failure to just discharge an accused in those circumstances if Nesri Miramotu is, in my view, a breach of the rights that are guaranteed by the constitutional, uh, Constitution and would narrowly vitiate a conviction based exclusively on his self-incriminatory evidence. The right to be discharged at this stage of the trial does not necessarily arise, in my view, from considerations relating to the burden of proof brackets, or its concomitant, the presumption of innocence, close brackets, or the right of silence, or the right to testify, but arguably from a consideration which is of more general application. A person ought not to be prosecuted in the absence of a minimum of evidence upon which he might be convicted, merely in the expectation that at some stage he might incriminate himself. That is recognized by the common law principle that there should be, quote within a quote, reasonable and probable, end quote, cause to believe that the accused is guilty of an offense before a prosecution is initiated. And the constitutional protection afforded to dignity and personal freedom, in brackets section 10 and section 12, close brackets, seem to reinforce it. It ought to follow that if a prosecution is not to be commenced without that minimum of evidence, so too should it cease when the evidence finally falls below that threshold. That will preeminently be so where the prosecution has exhausted the evidence and a conviction is no longer possible except by self-incrimination. A fair trial, in my view, would at that stage be stopped for it threatens thereafter to infringe our constitutional rights protected by Section 10 and Section 12. It has been held that the credibility of state witnesses at this stage of the proceedings only plays a very limited role. In State of S versus Mpeta, Williamson J held that the relevant evidence ignored if Quote, it is of such poor quality that no reasonable person could possibly accept it, end quote. This sentiment was also echoed and expanded on by Homo J in State v. Agliotti, 2011, brackets 2, South African Criminal Law Reports, 437, GSJ, who stated the following at 456 in fine, to 457B, quote, 272, in State v. La Vengua, 1996, brackets 2, South African Criminal Law Reports, 456W, 
the view was expressed that the processes under 174 translate into to a, a statutorily granted capacity to depart discretionally in certain specific and limited circumstances from the usual course to cut off the, sale, uh, the tail of a superfluous process. Such a capacity does not detract from either the right to silence or the protection against self-incrimination. If an acquittal flows at the end of the state case, the opportunity or need to present evidence by the defence falls away. If the discharged is refused, the accused still has the choice whether to testify or not. There is no obligation on him to testify. Once this court rules, there is no prima facie case against the accused. There also cannot be any negative consequences as a result of the accused's silence in this context. 273, I agree with the view that it is an exercise in futility to lay down rigid rules in advance for an infinite variety of factual situations which may or may not arise. It is thus, in my view, also, quote within a quote, unwise to attempt to banish issues of credibility, end quote, in the assessment of issues in terms of section 174, or to confine judicial discretion to musts and must nots, end quote. To therefore summarize the legal position in terms of section 174, it follows that first subparagraph, an accused is entitled to be discharged at the end of the case for the prosecution if there is no possibility of a conviction other than if he enters the witness box and incriminates himself. B, in deciding whether an accused person is entitled to be discharged at the close of the state case, the court may take into account the credibility of the state witnesses, even if only to a limited extent. Where the evidence, that's the next subparagraph, of the state witnesses implicating the accused is of such poor quality that it cannot safely be relied upon, and there is accordingly no credible evidence on record upon which a court, acting carefully, may convict, an application for discharge should be granted. It is common cause that the only witness who could implicate the accused was Tongo, who was an accomplice witness. It is trite that a court should approach the evidence of an accomplice witness with caution. The duty of a court in this regard has been described as follows in Rex versus Nkunana, 1948, 4 SA, 399 AD at 405. Quote, the cautious court or jury will often properly acquit in the absence of other evidence connecting the accused with the crime, but no rule of law or practice requires it to do so. What is required is that the trier of fact should warn himself, or, if the trier of fact is a jury, that it should be warned of the special danger of convicting on the evidence of an accomplice. For an accomplice is not merely a witness with a possible motive to tell lies about an innocent accused, but is such a witness peculiarly equipped by reason of his inside knowledge of the crime to convince the unwary that his lies are the truth. This special danger is not met by corroboration of an accomplice in material respects not implicating the accused, or by proof aleunde that the crime charged with was committed by someone. The risk that he will be convicted will be reduced and in the most satisfactory way if there is corroboration implicating the accused." End quote. In State v. Mahlabati and another, 1968, 2, SA 48A at page 50G to 51A, Portrieter J.A. dealt with this question as follows. It is clear from the authorities, if corroboration was required, it had, for the purpose of the so-called cautionary rule to be corroboration implicating the accused, 
and not merely corroboration in a material respect or respects. Potgieter also confirmed the views of Schreiner JA in the Kanana case. In State versus Gentle 2005, who won South African Criminal Law Reports 420, SCA at 430, Kluti JA, in dealing with the approach to be followed by a court when it is faced with a situation where a court could should caution itself in analyzing the evidence, said the following, quote, it must be emphasized immediately that by corroboration is meant other evidence which supports the evidence of the complainant and which renders the evidence of the accused less probable on the issues in dispute. In State v. Scott Crosley, 2008-1, South African Criminal Law Reports 223, SCA at 234, the court stressed that, quote, matters which are common cause between the state and the accused cannot provide corroboration for matters in dispute. Otherwise, for example, the fact that an accused in a rape case confirmed that he had sexual intercourse with a complainant could be taken as corroboration of the latter's version that he had done so with consent, which is plainly absurd. From the foregoing, it follows that the CC, images in the CCTV footage, to which I will refer in more detail later, depicting A, the accused meeting Tongo in the parking lot of the Cape Grace Hotel on flight Friday the 12th of November 2020, B, the accused being picked up by Tongo on Saturday morning, 30 November 2010, at the Cape Grace Hotel. C, the accused being dropped off again by Tongo later on that Saturday morning at the Cape Grace Hotel. D, the accused and the deceased being picked up by Tongo on the Saturday evening at the Cape Grace Hotel. E, the accused talking to Tongo after the incident on Sunday the 14th of November 2010, and F, the accused paying Tongo a thousand rand in the communication room on Tuesday the 16th of November, do not provide corroboration for the version of Tongo where it differs from that of the accused in his plea explanation, as these events were not an issue between the state and the defense. It is what was said during those events that is an issue and for that, there is only the version of Tongo. The same applies to the telephone communication between the accused and Tongo, between Tongo and Malombo, and Kwabe. This telephone communication does not in itself corroborate what was said during those calls. It merely confirms that the communication took place. Against the background of these legal principles, I will now proceed to analyze the evidence. Zola Tongo, at the outset it needs to be repeated that Mr. Tongo is the only witness who testified that the alleged conspiracy agreement was entered into with the accused and what the terms of the agreement were. It is clear that Mr. Tongo, Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni and in brackets, and Mr. Malombo, close brackets, acted in execution of a common purpose to commit at least the offenses of kidnapping and robbery and possibly also other offenses. The only issue which I have to determine is whether the evidence shows that the accused was part of that conspiracy. Evidence in chief. Mr. Tonga testified that he was an executive taxi driver on the day in question, namely the 12th of November 2010, and that he was at Cape Town International Airport waiting for fares. He stated that the accused approached him and asked him where he could find transport to town. Mr. Tonga responded that he could transport him to town, and although there was a taxi rank to which he directed the accused, he told the accused that those taxis were generally more expensive. The accused informed him that he wanted to go to the Cape Grace Hotel and informed Mr. Tongo 
that he was not alone and that his wife was with him. Mr. Tonga testified that while he was waiting, he saw, in inverted commas, lady come from the inside of the airport towards him. It is common cause that this woman was the deceased. Mr. Tonga's car was parked on the lower level of the parking garage. On their way to the parking garage, the deceased asked him why he was not parked where the other taxis were parked. He told her that he did not yet have a permit to park there. He testified that during the drive from the airport to the Cape Grace Hotel, he did all he could to market himself and his services to the couple. It is common cause that Mr. Tonga was driving the Volkswagen Chiron in which the deceased's body was found. On the way to the Cape Grace Hotel, Mr. Tonga told the couple about Cape Town's beauty, about the squatter camps, and the importance of the township of Guguletu, which is right next to the squatter camps. He told them about the well-known tavern Kwa Mazoli in Guguletu. He told them about other tourist attractions, such as the penguins at Boulders Beach. Mr. Tonga was hoping that the, the Wanis would use his services while they were in Cape Town. Mr. Tonga testified that en route there was very little interaction between the couple and himself. Upon their arrival at the Cape Grace Hotel, the deceased accompanied a porter with their luggage to the reception area while the accused remained behind at the car in order to pay Mr. Tonga his fare. At that stage, Mr. Tonga gave him one of his business cards. The accused then informed him that he has a job for him and that he was, must wait for him in the parking area of the hotel. Mr. Tonga went to park his car in the parking area and waited. The accused then went inside the hotel to check in and after a while returned and got into Mr. Tonga's vehicle. The accused then informed him that the job that he had for Mr. Tonga would make his business grow because he, the accused, was from overseas and can refer other travelers to him who in turn would refer further travelers to him. Shortly thereafter, the accused told him that the real job that he, the accused, had for Mr. Tonga was that he wanted somebody, quote, removed from the eyes, end quote. When Mr. Tongo asked him to explain what he meant, he stated that he wanted somebody to be killed. Mr. Tongo told the accused that he was not involved in such things, but informed him that he knew somebody who lives in the location who might know about people who would be prepared to do it. According to Mr. Tongo, he was at all times informed by the accused that it was his, quote, business partner, end quote, who would be arriving the following day that he wanted killed. Mr. Tonga knew that the person to be killed was a woman. Mr. Tonga and the accused parted company on the basis that if Mr. Tonga should find somebody who would be prepared to do the job, he would contact the accused and inform him accordingly. The two gentlemen exchanged phone numbers. They also discussed the remuneration that would be paid for the job, and the accused explained that he would, have been, that he would be prepared to pay 15,000 rand when the job was done. Over and above the 15,000 rand, Mr. Tonga would receive an amount of 5,000 rand. The accused also stated that he had dollars and could pay in dollars. Mr. Tonga thereafter left and immediately went to Century City to the Proteo Coliseum Hotel, where he met his friend, Mr. Monde Mbolombo, who worked as a receptionist at the hotel. Mr. Tonga explained that the reason why he approached Mr. Mbolombo was because Mr. Mbolombo lives in the location and he, quote, knows everything that happens in the location. Put a few dots still part of the quote, I realize that there must be things that he is aware of, comma, things that are happening in the locations, things that I am not aware of, end quote. 
Mr. Tonga explained to Mr. Malombo what he wanted. Mr. Malombo immediately informed him that there is a young man that he knows who might be prepared who do, to do the job. Mr. Malombo therefore took his phone, went outside with Mr. Tongo, where they phoned this person and explained to that person about the job. It is common cause that the person that Mr. Malombo phoned was Mr. Kwabe. Mr. Tongo heard Mr. Malombo explain to Mr. Kwabe what he, Mr. Tongo, had explained to Mr. Malombo and asked whether it would be in order if the person who mandated this deal could make payment in dollars. Mr. Kwabe stated that they, in inverted commas, did not want dollars. It had to be South African rands. Mr. Kwabe stated that he still had to contact a friend. Mr. Tonga testified that while they were outside, he took the particulars of this person, being Mr. Kwabe, from Mr. Malombo. He could, however, not remember his name and accordingly listed him in his contact list under the letter H. Mr. Tonga phoned Mr. Kwabe at a later stage in order to find out, quote, how things were going, end quote. Mr. Kwabe informed him that things were going just fine, but that he was still going to meet another man and he is, quote, promising, end quote. Mr. Tonga testified that he spoke to the accused later that evening because the accused wanted to make sure that he found the people who would do the job, in inverted commas. He stated that upon informing the accused about the fact that the assailants would not want to be paid in dollars, the accused asked whether he was aware of a place where he could change his dollars. Mr. Tonga knew of such a place because whenever he was tipped by overseas visitors in dollars, that is where he would subsequently exchange them. The accused and Mr. Tonga then arranged for a time to meet the following day so that Mr. Tonga could take the accused to the money changer. Mr. Tonga testified that he was slightly late. He testified that the accused phoned him and asked him whether he had forgotten to come and collect him, and he sounded agitated. Mr. Tonga told the accused that he had been delayed, but that he was on his way to the Cape Grace Hotel from the waterfront. When he arrived at the hotel, the accused immediately came out of the hotel and told Mr. Tonga that they must hurry because his wife was still in the shower or washing. Mr. Tonga stated that he did not know how much the accused was going to change. While he was waiting for the accused in the shop, he heard one of the women who works in the shop say, quote, this is a lot of money that you are coming to exchange here, end quote. In the car on the way back to the Cape Grace Hotel from the money changer, the discussion about the, quote, the job, end quote, continued. On their arrival at the hotel, Mr. Tongo parked his car and had further discussions with the accused about how the job was going to be done. It is during this discussion that the accused informed Mr. Tongo that he wanted the car to be hijacked, that they must be robbed, whereafter Mr. Tongo must first be dropped off, and then they must also drop him, the accused, along the way, and then they must kill the, quote, business partner, end quote. There was no discussion as to how, where, or when the business partner, in quotations, must be killed. It was then agreed that Mr. Tonga would collect the Dewanis from the Cape Grace Hotel at 7.30 p.m. on the Saturday evening, that he would then show them the waterfront, and that they would then go to Kuguletu. Mr. Tonga then made arrangements to meet with Mr. Mbalombo and Mr. Kwabe on the Saturday afternoon. This meeting could not take place because Mr. Tonga had business commitments. Later, an arrangement was made for Mr. Tonga to meet with Mr. Kwabe at the Kaya Bazaar. He later phoned Mr. Kwabe, who told him to wait at a bus stop in Kaya Licha. This Mr. Tonga did. Mr. Kwabe arrived 
and introduced himself as Spra, which is his nickname, and informed Mr. Tonga that they must meet the other person who is going to work with them. They then drove to the other person who later transpired to be Mr. Mgeni. Mr. Mgeni got into the car and introduced himself as Olile. This was Mr. Tonga's first encounter with both Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni. Mr. Kwabe asked Mr. Mgeni whether he remembered that he, Mr. Kwabe, had phoned him, telling him about a job. He then told Mr. Mgeni that, quote, here is the man, end quote, with reference to Mr. Tongo. Mr. Tongo then explained to them what the accused wanted done. He said the man, with reference to the accused, wanted his business partner, who was going to arrive later that day, to be killed. He wanted it to look like a hijacking. Thereafter, they, in brackets the hijackers, must first drop Mr. Tonga, and after driving on for a while, they must drop the accused, and then lastly, they must kill the business partner. Mr. Tonga then explained that he was going to collect the Diwanis at the Cape Grace Hotel at 7.30 p.m. and would drive around in town with them from where he would go to Kuguletu and where they would pass Mzoli's place. There is a T-junction in the road where it was arranged that the two young men would wait for Mr. Tongo. Mr. Tongo testified that at one stage he phoned his friend Ta Vuks and asked him whether he wouldn't do the transfer for him. He wanted Ta Vuks to collect the Diwanis and to take them to their required destination. The reason why he did this, he testified, was that, quote, his knees were shaking, end quote, and he was scared. Tavuks could I ever not accommodate him, so he decided to do it himself because he had already initiated it. On the Saturday evening, Mr. Tonga was running late for his arranged pickup time with the Diwanis. He received a phone call from the accused who asked him where he was. He told the accused that he was delayed, but that he was on his way. Mr. Tonga testified that on arriving at the Cape Grace Hotel, although he was late, he first cleaned his car and engaged the child locks on both rear doors before he collected the Diwanis. He then texted the accused to say that he was there and the accused came out with a woman. Mr. Tonga stated that the lady, in inverted commas, was not the same woman as the one who was with the accused on the previous day. He thought that she was the business partner, in inverted commas. The accused and the woman got into the car and they left the Cape Grace Hotel, drove around Cape Town and then went to Kukuletu. Upon their arrival in Guguletu, Mr. Tonga did not see Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni at the place where they were supposed to meet, and then suggested to the couple that he take them to Somerset West slash Strand, where there is a restaurant on the beach. While on the N2, Mr. Tonga received a phone call from Mr. Kwabe, who apologized for not being at the designated place at the agreed time and stated that they were having difficulty with transport. Mr. Tonga testified about his reasons for taking the couple to Somerset West. Quote, Firstly, the reason was that we, what we have decided did not happen. And secondly, I'm on my way facing in that direction. And thirdly, I would be able to communicate with this young man and find out because here in the car, I am being looked at with big eyes, end quote. Mr. Tonga testified that when they arrived at Somerset West slash Strand, the accused asked him what had happened because the hit did not take place in Guguletu as planned. Mr. Tonga then informed the accused that the young men were delayed because of transport problems. 
He stated that the accused then told him that he must make sure that everything is, quote, going well, end quote. Mr. Tongo dropped them at the restaurant, where after he went to fill his car with petrol, bought some airtime, and went, went back where he waited for the couple. He contacted Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni and told them where he was. He wanted them to come to Somerset West, but they stated that they could not do so because Somerset West is wet, in inverted commas. Wet, in inverted commas, is a term which indicates that there are many police officers around. Mr. Tonga said that he conveyed that message to the accused and stated that Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni would wait for them in Guguletu at the designated place. Mr. Tonga then stated that he had a telephone conversation with the accused who inquired whether everything was still going to happen as agreed, whereupon Mr. Tongo informed him that it was. They then proceeded along the N2 towards Guguletu, and Mr. Tongo said that he saw in his rearview mirror that the accused was looking directly at him with wide open eyes, put that in inverted commas. He stated that his knees became weak. Mr. Tonga explained that the money for Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni would be left in the car. In the earlier discussions, it was agreed that the money would be placed in the cubbyhole of the vehicle. But Mr. Tonga testified that the accused told him in Somerset West slash Strand that the money was in the pouch behind the left front passenger seat. At all times, it was agreed that the amount that had to be placed in the car was 15,000 rand. Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mlombo, however, both testified that only 10,000 rand was found in the car. Mr. Tongo testified that he had nothing to do with how payment was going to take place, as that was the responsibility of Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni. All he knew was that he, Tongo, would be paid 5,000 rand for his input once the job was done. They then left the strand. Mr. Tongo turned off the highway into Guguletu, and upon the, their arrival at the designated place, he noticed Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni waiting for them. They were then hijacked by Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni, who were both armed with handguns. Mr. Tonga was forced to the rear seat next to the accused and the woman. Mr. Kwabe got behind the steering wheel and Mr. Mgeni got into the front passenger seat. Mr. Mgeni robbed the accused and the woman of their valuables and also took Mr. Tonga's cell phone. Mr. Tonga testified that both Mr. Mgeni and Mr. Kwabe had firearms. The one he described as a nine millimeter and the other as a flywheel, which apparently describes a revolver. During the robbery, Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni instructed everybody to hand over their telephones and everything that they had. Everybody, including Mr. Tonga, obliged. <coughs> Mr. Tonga stated that he handed over his Nokia E90 because he knew that the robbery was part of the plan. He, however, had another phone, a BlackBerry, which he retained. Mr. Tonga stated that while all this was happening, the deceased was crying, but he cannot remember what she was saying, or, in fact, whether she said anything. The accused was trying to console her, but he also cannot remember whether he said anything. Everybody was then told to put their heads down, which they did, until they arrived at a spot behind the Guguletu police barracks where there is a stop sign. At the stop sign, the back door of the vehicle was opened from the outside by Mr. Mgeni. He told Mr. Tonga to get out. Subsequently, Mr. Tonga went to the Guguletu police station where he reported the matter. A statement was taken from him but Mr. Tonga concedes that he did not tell the truth in that statement. Mr. Tonga told the police that he had forgotten the names of his passengers, but that he knew where they were staying. The police then took Mr. Tonga to the Cape Grace Hotel. He stated that upon arrival at the Cape Grace Hotel, he noticed a police vehicle. 
Mr. Tongo stated that the accused came out, approached him, and asked him whether he was okay. This discussion took, a place, took place around midnight. Mr. Tongo stated that from the time that he arrived at the hotel, the accused approached him every now and again to ask him whether he was okay, whether he was fine, and whether he had heard anything. At one stage, Mr. Tonga went outside in the company of a police officer who was known only as Mr. Blacks. Mr. Blacks questioned him and told him that he must not wait to seize time as he, Mr. Blacks, was of the view that Mr. Tonga knew what had happened. They had an argument and Mr. Tonga went back into the hotel. A CCTV clip was then shown with the accused and Mr. Tonga on the terrace of the Cape Grace Hotel. A cleaner can be seen entering the area where the accused and Mr. Tongo were. He left after the accused apparently asked him to give them some privacy. According to Mr. Tongo, the accused continually kept asking him whether he was fine and also wanted to know whether the job, in inverted commas, had been done. Mr. Tongo replied that he did not know. Mr. Tonga was thereafter taken back to the Guguletu police station. Mr. Blacks also accompanied him to the scene where the hijack took place. Mr. Blacks again questioned Mr. Tonga and told him that he knows about the incident. Mr. Tonga got impatient with Mr. Blacks and then phoned a friend to come and fetch him. Two of his friends arrived to come and fetch him at between one and 2 a.m. Thereafter, Mr. Tonga went to the Vanguard Mall to do a SIM swap. He retained his own number. He stated the journalists had tried to get hold of him and ultimately did get hold of him and offered him money for his story. He stated that he had spoken to a certain Mike, in inverted commas, who was working for a newspaper in Britain. On the Tuesday morning, Mr. Tonga phoned Captain Lutchman and explained to him that the journalists were bothering him. Captain Lutchman was at the time in the presence of the accused. Captain Lutchman put the accused on the line to speak to Mr. Tonga. The first thing that the accused asked was whether he, Mr. Tonga, was fine. Mr. Tonga replied that he was not fine, but that he was still alive. The accused said to him that there is a number at which he's going to call Mr. Tongo as he wanted to pay him the outstanding money. Mr. Tongo stated that the accused later phoned him to say that he must come and collect the money and they arranged that they would meet at the bridge leading to the waterfront coming from the Cape Grace Hotel. Mr. Tongo waited there, but the accused did not show up. Mr. Tonga phoned the accused, who informed him that he could not get out of the hotel because of the presence of all the journalists. He told Mr. Tonga to come to the hotel to collect the money. When Mr. Tonga entered the hotel, he saw the accused standing at the beginning of a corridor. He said that the accused signaled to him that he had to follow him. They moved into the communication center where the accused gave him an envelope in a plastic bag where after he left. Mr. Tongo then went to the toilet where he opened the envelope and counted the money inside and saw that it was only a thousand rand. He was very angry, folded the envelope and put it in his back pocket. He carried the plastic packet in his hand. As he left the toilet, he looked down the passage to his right to see if he could not see the accused. He did not see the accused and left the hotel. On either the Wednesday or the Thursday, Mr. Tonga was not quite sure, Captain Hendricks contacted him and asked him to visit their offices in Belleville. Mr. Tonga stated that Captain Hendricks begged him that if he knew anything, he had to tell him. He stated that he knew nothing and gave Captain Hendricks a statement, which was false. 
On the Thursday, Mr. Tonga appointed an attorney, Mr. William de Graaf, to represent him. He stated that he did this firstly because he was scared and secondly because he knew that the police assaulted people. On Saturday 20 November 2010, Mr. de Graaf informed Mr. Tongo that the police were looking for him. It was arranged that he would go to their offices where he handed himself over to Mr. Uh, Captain Hendricks in the presence of his attorney, Mr. de Graaf. At that stage, Mr. Tonga was aware that Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni had been arrested. Mr. Tonga entered into a plea and sentence agreement with the state, which was signed on 5 December 2010. On 7 Dece December 2010, he was convicted and sentenced in accordance with the plea and sentence agreement by Judge President Schlope. His sentence was one of 18 years imprisonment. Mr. Tongo stated that he realized that the deceased was killed on the Sunday morning for the first time. That was also the first time that he found out that the deceased was in fact the wife of the accused. Mr. Tongo stated that the accused never discussed a helicopter trip with him. Mr. Tongo was thereafter questioned about the role of Mr. Mbolombo. Mr. Tonga was adamant that Mr. Malombo's only role was to connect Mr. Tongo with Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mengeni. He stated that after the incident, Mr. Malombo contacted him because he wanted his money from Mr. Tonga, and Mr. Tonga informed him that he must get his money from Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mengeni. Mr. Tonga explained that he decided to cooperate with the police because he realized that what he did was wrong, that he was a fool, and that he had been misled. In terms of the plea agreement entered into by Mr. Tonga, he indicated his willingness to testify in any subsequent criminal trials instituted in regard to the alleged conspiracy. To this end, a comprehensive affidavit was obtained from him by Lieutenant Colonel Barkhuysen. Mr. Tonga and his attorney, Mr. de Gras, who was also present throughout, were given the opportunity to consider the final typed version of this document, whereafter on the 26th of November 2010, 13 days after the incident, Mr. Tonga signed the affidavit. This affidavit was handed in as an exhibit during the course of the trial. Mr. Tonga's plea agreement, which was signed by him and his attorney on the 5th of December 2010, was also handed in as an exhibit. Cross-examination. During cross-examination, a slightly different picture emerged from the evidence of Mr. Tonga. Mr. Tonga's evidence was riddled with contradictions. Some of these contradictions relate merely to peripheral issues, and I will not deal with them in any great detail. However, others are far more fundamental. His evidence and the version of events which he gave are also highly improbable. But having said that, it must be borne in mind that at this stage of the proceedings, credibility plays a limited role. The shortcomings in his evidence must be carefully scrutinized to determine whether his evidence is so poor that the court can ignore it. When Mr. Tonga was confronted with these contradictions and or improbabilities, his refrain was either that he had, quote, made a mistake, end quote, or that as time went by, his memory of the events of the evening had improved. It is self-evident that the circumstances under which the agreement which underlies this conspiracy was entered into is material. In this regard, Mr. Tonga testified in chief that upon arrival at the Cape Grace Hotel on the Friday, and after the accused had handed him his fare, he handed the accused his business card. The accused then told him that he has a job for him and that he was made wait for him for a few minutes, minutes whilst he goes to the reception desk to check in. 
In cross-examination, Mr. Tongo confirmed that it was only after the accused had returned from the reception desk that he learned that the job entailed the killing of a person. In his affidavit, however, Mr. Tongo stated this discussion took place before the accused went to the reception area. Therefore, the accused asked Mr. Tongo to kill someone within minutes of arriving at the Cape Grace Hotel, having met Mr. Tongo at most 30 minutes earlier. Mr. Tongo, who is not a person with a criminal record, then told him that he does not associate himself with, quote, such things, end quote, but immediately indicated that he could call somebody in the township who may know somebody who associated himself with that type of life. That person we now know was Mr. Mulombo. By poor coincidence, his friend, Mr. Mulombo, immediately agreed to assist him, phoned Mr. Kwabe, who also quite coincidentally was happy to oblige for a fee of 15,000 Rand. On their version, quite by chance, Mr. Kwabe was in the company of Mr. Mgeni when the call came through from Mr. Tongo. On Mr. Tongo's own evidence, this was the first time in his life that he received a request to assist in the killing, killing of a person. And although the contradiction as to when this discussion actually took place may in itself not seem significant, when looked at in context, it becomes very significant. Mr. Tongo testified that when the accused returned to his vehicle from the reception, he told him that he has a job for him that will make his business grow, and because he is from overseas, he can refer other travelers to Mr. Tongo. Thereafter, the accused said that there was somebody to be killed. The person to be killed was his business partner, who would be arriving the next day. The accused said that he was prepared to pay 15,000 to have her killed, 15,000 rand, sorry, to have her killed, which amount would be payable after the job had been done. He also undertook to pay Mr. Tongo 5,000 rand after the job had been done. The accused therefore expanded on his initial request when he returned from the reception area. Mr. Tonga was adamant throughout his evidence that what actually persuaded him to get involved in the commission of this crime was the promise by the accused that he would make his business grow rather than the 5,000 rand remuneration which he was offered. In his affidavit, however, no mention whatsoever is made of the so-called promise by the accused to refer clients to him and to grow his business. When one considers that this was the main motivating, motivating factor why Mr. Tongo, who had never previously been involved in criminal activities, was prepared to get involved, it is indeed strange that he did not mention this in his statement. For this discrepancy, Mr. Tongo blames Lieutenant Colonel Barkaisen, who took his statement. Then there is the question of the identity of the person that had to be killed. In his statement, Mr. Tongo stated that the person that had to be killed was a woman and that she was arriving later that evening." End quote. In his plea agreement, Mr. Tonga describes the person who must be killed as a, quote, client of the accused. In his evidence, he testified that the accused explained that the person to be killed is his, quote, business partner, end quote, who would be arriving the next day. Mr. Tonga even stated in his evidence quite categorically that the woman that he went to pick up at the hotel on the Saturday evening was not the deceased. However, in his statement, he specifically said that the woman that he picked up at the hotel on the Saturday evening was the same lady. When confronted with these startling contradictions, he once again blamed it on Lieutenant Colonel Barkaisen. Both in his plea explanation and in his affidavit, Mr. Tonga stated that the accused had asked him if he knew of a place where he could exchange his dollars for rands 
and where he did not have to produce his passport. This money was, according to Mr. Tongo, earmarked to pay the killers. In cross-examination, it transpired that the accused never indicated that he did not want to produce his passport. His passport was, in fact, never mentioned. Mr. Tongo stated that that was just something that he, Mr. Tongo, thought. That is his explanation for including it in his statement. And this he attributes to a mistake. This is a serious mistake because if in fact the accused deliberately wanted to act in a manner to hide the fact that he had changed money to pay the killers, it would certainly call for an explanation from the accused. It is further, a further indication of how Mr. Tonga was prepared to lie in a way which creates an atmosphere of suspicion regarding the accused. Mr. Tonga testified that he drove from the Cape Grace Hotel to the Proteo Coliseum Hotel at Century City to see his friend Monde Molombo. He told Mr. Molombo that he had transported clients from the airport to the Cape Grace Hotel, where the accused said that he had a job for him. He proceeded to explain to Mr. Molombo what the job was, namely that the accused wants somebody who would be arriving the next day to be taken, quote, out of sight, end quote. Mr. Mblombo, who similarly does not have a criminal record, immediately said that there is a young man that he knows and that he is going to phone and explain to him about the job. Mr. Mblombo then phoned this person and explained to him exactly what Mr. Tongo had told him. According to Mr. Tongo, Mr. Mulombo told the person at the other end of the phone, who we now know to be Mr. Kwabe, that the person, presumably with reference to the accused, said he wanted his business partner, who will be arriving the next day, killed, and that he was prepared to pay 15,000 rand for the job. Mr. Mulombo also inquired whether Mr. Kwabe would be prepared to accept dollars as payment but he was informed that they wanted rands. Mr. Tonga did not mention anything in his evidence in chief regarding any possible payment to Mr. Mulombo for his efforts. In cross-examination, he stated that Mr. Mulombo was going to be paid, but not by him, but by the young men referring to Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Ngeni. This he testifies is something that he now, in inverted commas, remembers. Mr. Tonga further testified that he could not remember how much money Mr. Mbalombo was going to be paid by the young men, but that was their concern. It had nothing to do with him, Tonga. However, in his affidavit, he stated that Mr. Mbalombo wanted 5,000 rand for organizing Mr. Kwabe, the hitman, and that Mr. Mbalombo suggested quote, we should pay Kwabe only 10,000 rand and that he, Mlombo, would take 5,000 rand. Mr. Tongo then explained that Mr. Mlombo did say that he wanted 5,000 rand, but that how much money he was going to earn really had nothing to do with him. He responded as follows, quote, Monday was going to get his share, milady. Whether he was going to get 5,000 rand, 2,000 rand, or 1,000 rand, I do not know." End of quote. Thereafter, he was confronted with his plea explanation, where he stated, quote, Monde said he wanted 5,000 rand for organizing the hitman, and that we should pay the hitman 10,000 rand. End quote. To this, Mr. Tonga once again replied that Mr. Malombo was at all times going to get his share, but how much his share was, he does not know, and then stated that he does not remember that Mr. Malombo stated that he wanted 5,000 rand. Mr. Tonga's evidence in this regard is telling, and I quote, Monday, According to what is written here, maybe I can't recall that very well. 
He wanted 5,000 rand, if that is the case. My response to him was that the young men are going to pay you. So you remember now that he wanted 5,000 rand and that you told him that the young men would be paying him? Do I understand you correctly? That is correct, sir. Why didn't you tell the police that in your statement? Maybe that was just, was just forgotten, but it is written here, sir. That was forgotten, but you did not forget twice to relay the fact that Monday wanted 5,000 rand and stated that the hitman should get 10,000 rand. Is that correct? I said everybody makes mistakes. As you also said, I am ZH, but I am ZR. This evidence is indicative of how Mr. Tonga could change his version under pressure of cross-examination without the slightest hesitation. This aspect of Mr. Tonga's evidence raises a further important question. At all material times, the accused only had dealings with Mr. Tonga. He had never even met Mr. Malombo, Mr. Kwabe, or Mr. Mgeni. The only person with whom the accused could negotiate to pay the various role players was Mr. Tonga. There was no to evidence that Mr. Tonga had received any money from the accused, which he could hand over to the two young men to pay Mr. Malombo. Nor was it ever suggested that the accused was instrumental in getting any money to them. In addition, both Mr. Mblombo and Mr. Kwabe contradict Mr. Tonga on just about every aspect of their interactions on the Friday evening. Mr. Mblombo testified that Mr. Tonga told him that there is something he wanted to talk to him about. On his question as to what Mr. Tonga wanted to talk about, Mr. Tonga said to him, is there no one that I know who is a hitman? Put that in quotation marks. Mr. Malombo then phoned Mr. Kwabe and told him that there is a person with him whose name is Zola who is looking for a hitman. Mr. Kwabe asked him whether he knew this person. He responded by saying that he does know Mr. Tonga, whereupon Mr. Kwabe inquired how much they would be paid if they agreed to do the job. Mr. Malombo did not know, called Mr. Tonga closer, switched off the phone and found out what the agreed remuneration would be. Thereafter, he redialed Mr. Kwabe's number and informed him that Mr. Tonga said they would be earning 15,000 rand. Mr. Kwabe then stated that they should not discuss the matter any further over the phone, but make arrangements to meet. Mr. Balombo further testified that on hearing about the 15,000 rand, he told Mr. Tonga that he, Mr. Malombo, should also get something for his efforts, even if it is 5,000 rand for his involvement. To this, Mr. Tonga did not respond. Mr. Malombo testified that on the Friday night, he had no idea who the person was who was going to be killed and that he did not ask Mr. Tonga. He contradicts Mr. Tonga's evidence that he explained to Mr. Malombo that the accused wanted his business partner, who was arriving the next day, killed. Mr. Kwabe stated that he has no recollection that there was any reference to dollars in his telephonic discussion with Mr. Malombo, and stated that had there been mention of dollars, he would have remembered it. He also denied any arrangement that he and Mr. Mgeni would have paid Mr. Malombo anything. Accordingly, the evidence of Mr. Malombo, Mr. Kwabe, and Mr. Tonga do not support each other. Mr. Tonga testified that he phoned Mr. Kwabe later on the Friday evening as he wanted to know how things were going, whereupon Mr. Kwabe responded that everything was going fine and that he was still going to meet with another man and quote, he is promising, end quote. Mr. Kwabe's version of his telephonic discussion completely contradicts Mr. Tonga's testimony. According to Mr. Kwabe, Mr. Tonga told him that he needed somebody to be killed and asked him whether he knew anybody who can do it. At that stage, Mr. Kwabe testified 
that he was in Mr. Mugheni's test of, uh, company, who said that he would be prepared to do it. Mr. Tonga thereupon asked him for what fee they would be prepared to do it, and Mr. Mugheni then responded by saying he would do it for 15,000 rand. They then agreed to meet the following day. During cross-examination, Mr. Kwabe testified that Mr. Tonga had told him that there was a husband who wanted his wife, in brackets, not a business partner, close brackets, killed. Mr. Kwabe was at pains to stress that the amount of 15,000 rand was determined by Mr. Mungeni and not by Mr. Tonga. The two versions of what happened during this telephone conversation are clearly irreconcilable. Mr. Tonga's evidence regarding the events on Saturday morning was clearly tendered with the intention to create the impression that the accused had to change the dollars into rands to be able to pay the hitman and that the accused was very anxious to do so. That is why Mr. Tonga testified that he had received a call from the accused in which the accused, in an agitated state, asked him whether he had forgotten about their appointment to go to the money changer. Mr. Tongo further testified that he then rushed to the Cape Grace Hotel and when he arrived, the accused immediately came walking out of the door. The accused told him that they must hurry as his wife was having a shower or washing. This evidence was proved by the CCTV footage to be untrue. The CCTV footage shows that the accused and the deceased appeared from their bedroom shortly before 11.15 a.m. The accused was dressed in shorts, sandals, and a gray polo shirt, and had his sunglasses on his head. The deceased was dressed in white trousers and a pink top, also with sunglasses on her head. The court was informed that there was CCTV footage available to show that they then went to breakfast and thereafter went to the pool. This footage was, however, not shown. At 11.52.19, Mr. Tonga texts the accused, and at 11.53, the accused replied in a text by saying, quote, okay, give me 10 minutes, end quote. The CCTV footage shows that the accused had changed from his pool clothes into trousers and a golf shirt. There is no record whatsoever of a telephone call made by the accused to Mr. Tongo on that Saturday morning. The CCTV footage denies the fact that the accused was in a hurry, in a hurry and desperate to go to the money changer. In fact, it seems apparent that the accused was late for the appointment and still had to go to his room to change before going to the money changer. Mr. Mob conceded that Mr. Tongo exaggerated the haste with which the accused wanted the transaction done, but stated that this is not a deliberate falsehood, but understandable in view of the time that has lapsed since the incident. I do not agree. This evidence was clearly tendered with a view to create the impression that the accused was extremely anxious to have the money changed and which he was due to pay the killers. Mr. Tonga further testified that upon their return from the money changer at the Cape Grace Hotel, he and the accused discussed how the job should be done. The accused said that he wanted the car hijacked. Then they must be robbed where after the hijackers must first drop Mr. Tonga and then himself, where after they must kill the woman. The further details of the evening were also discussed. Mr. Tonga confirmed in cross-examination that this discussion took place after their arrival from the money changer at the hotel whilst they were sitting in Mr. Tonga's parked car. However, he was then shown CCTV footage of them arriving from the money changer. The car had hardly stopped when the accused alighted and walked towards the hotel. On the CCTV footage, one then sees the car leaving the hotel. It was therefore clearly a figment of Mr. Tongo's imagination that the discussion took place in the parking lot of the hotel. 
Once Mr. Tonga was caught out on this lie, he again changed tack with apparent ease and stated that the conversation actually took place in the motor vehicle while they were driving and once again called this discrepancy a mistake. Mr. Tonga further testified that he told Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mugeni that the 15,000 rand would be in the cubbyhole of his vehicle because that was what had been agree agreed with the accused that morning. Mr. Tonga was then confronted with his statement in which he said, the first man, in brackets, Mr. Kwabe, said that we had to leave the 15,000 rand in the cubbyhole of my vehicle as they wanted payment available to them as soon as the job had been done. In his evidence, he told the court explicitly that it was the decision of Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni that the 15,000 rand had to be left in the cubbyhole. When it was put to him that his earlier evidence was that the accused agreed with him that morning that the money should be left in the cubbyhole, he suddenly could no longer remember whether the accused had said that. The one fact that is, however, of crucial importance is that Mr. Tonga knew when he left the Cape Grace Hotel on the Saturday evening that there was no money whatsoever in the cubbyhole. There is also no suggestion that Mr. Tonga, before he left the hotel, asked the accused for the money. He did not even know whether the accused had the money with him. Questioned about what would happen to his motor vehicle after the woman had been killed, he testified that Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Ngeni had to abandon the car on the spot where they were going to kill the woman. Later, he testified that he did not know where they were going to leave the motor vehicle. At yet a later stage, he was confronted with the audio recording of a telephone discussion which took place between him and Mr. Mbolombo at 18.38 on the Saturday evening, during which Mr. Mbolombo said, oh, so the car should get there and get washed. That's a quote. Mr. Tonga responded, and I quote, once this thing has been done, Kwabe and Mkeni was to leave the car near the car wash that was, in a few dots, close to Mlombo's house in Kailicha. End quote. This discrepancy he could not explain. To expose his vehicle, which was his livelihood, to this kind of risk cannot be believed. Mr. Tonga's evidence about whether he knew the identities of Mr. and Mrs. Kwabe, uh, Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni is also strange. In his statement, he refers to Mr. Kwabe as the first man, Mr. Mgeni as the second man. He also stated that he was never introduced to them. However, in his evidence in chief, he testified that both Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni introduced themselves to him on the Saturday afternoon, even though he denied that he had known their names. First, he tried to attribute this to the police taking down his evidence incorrectly. He then tried to say that he could not remember their names, and then he replied, quote, let's say then that's a mistake that happened that I never mentioned, but they did introduce themselves to me, and I just forgot their names, but as time went on, I then remembered their names again. The court is going to take the adjournment at this stage.
Four minutes. Two minutes. And okay, two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, two minutes. As soon as you see her, then you can go in. Anything I can do to help somebody? Mm -hmm. Pray. <laughs> 